Hey, well, welcome back again um, to now what's becoming our weekly posting of IPSA's IFRS training material. Um, we decided this week that we would do liabilities. We've been working on some stuff for some clients in the office looking at particularly training them in the recognition of liabilities. Now, they're in rather specific financial services group, but we figured that we'd do this anyway. Um, Bearing in mind that our background, that where we're coming at all of this stuff from, is that we're looking at introduction of accrual accounting, be it either IFRS or be it IPSAs. My particular background started with IFRS or IPSAs. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I'll just do the normal speech. For those of you who haven't caught up with me so far, my name is Mark Fielding Pritchard. I work for mefielding.com. Actually, not ME Fieldings, as it says on the slide. So you can see mefielding.com, and we've had a few um, we've had a few emails from people as well saying, "Where can they find the other videos?" Well, surprise, surprise, they're all out there on on um, YouTube. So have a look at YouTube. And in fact, I'm just going to correct that slide before we move on to the next one. So let's move on. Mark Fielding Pritchard, looking at liabilities today. Um, just to say as well that we will be doing inventory. I think we've got inventory three and four and leases three and four to put up yet as well. So that's another month of training courses to come yet. Some of you said we're doing this in rather a haphazard way, but we tend to produce these videos when we're working on this stuff in the office. So here we go. Let's get pushed on then. Yeah, and I'll just take the S. So by the time you see this presentation, it will say mefielding.com at the top of this slide as opposed to mefieldings that it currently says. Okay, that's, that's, that's much better now. So now our second slide, slide number two, says here liabilities. So understanding the difference between the budget cycle and the accounting cycle. Right, this is, this is really, really important that you get this. But for those of you who are working in government accounting systems, you usually have what's called the three pillar system. So you have one system, one of those three pillars will look at cash availability. So you'll have a budget. So let's assume that you are looking in at a department which is looking at purchasing motor vehicles. In, in that department, therefore, you will be able to purchase a certain number and a certain type of motor vehicles. Now, this is what we call the budget cycle. This is nothing to do whatsoever with production of your accounts. Your computer system will say, okay, here's your, here's your project, here's your department. You will have identification codes which set out that department. And then the computer system will allow you to spend a certain sum of money which is processed through certain purchasing codes. So if you have SAP, for example, therefore it will give you that ability to spend that money. Let's assume that your boss says, okay, we need to buy a brand new Ford Explorer Jeep you will go in and you will have a procurement process. So usually you will raise a requisition. The purchasing, um, the person who needs the motor car will raise the requisition. That will go to his boss who will approve the requisition. It then goes to the procurement department, this idea of segregation of duties, and they raise a purchase order. Now in things like SAP and Oracle, you will then have a button which is called dispatch. Dispatch will then do, it dispatches, it sends that purchase order to two places. It dispatches it to your computer system and it also sends a copy to the supplier. So if you're 100% um, electronified, if that's the word, electrified, up to speed, then your, your supplier will get a copy of that purchase order as well. And that is your order. And he will then either deliver on the basis of that or if it's a more rigid system, he will then send you a contract to sign. Right, that's the purchase side of it. In terms of the computer system, what will happen is that that purchase order will then do what we call encumber funds. So from your cash available to spend, it will deduct that sum of money. Okay, right, that's your, that's your budget cycle. You've raised the requisition, you've raised the purchase order. The purchase order deducts from available cash the sum of money for this Ford motor vehicle and when you buy the car, when you actually pay the cash, the computer system will deduct from cash balance and then it will remove that encumbrance on funds because the cash is now gone. Right, that is the budget cycle. Please notice that is not the accounting cycle. 
So what the accounting cycle says is at what point, so please notice we've moved on now, we've moved on from the budgeting cycle to the accounting cycle. In the accounting cycle, which is how we prepare our monthly and our annual accounts, at what point do we show that we have an expense? Now with the motor vehicle, we've obviously purchased an asset, so it's not an expense. So let's just twist, let's just change our example slightly. Let's assume it's an electricity bill. At what point, at what point is this bill, this charge for some expense going to be registered in our account? Now, just look at the slide. If we're looking at the cash basis, it will be recognized when we pay the cash. Okay, so it will actually be recognized when we pay the cash. And that's what the cash basis means. Under IPSAs and IFRS, we take a much more legal view. So we say, okay, at what point have we acquired this, this item? Right, if it's electricity and we've used electricity, then it's going on as we're using it. Yeah. So therefore, usually what will happen is actually you'll recognize it when you get the bill. So you recognize the liability when the electricity company raised the electricity bill. Because at that point, we have legally got the electricity. In fact, legally, we probably got it before. But at that point, we can say, well, we've got it, we've used it, and we know what it costs. If it's a physical good, uh, let, let's just say, say a physical good, something which is an expense, so a, a pack of paper. If it's a pack of paper, then usually it's when you take delivery. Because at that point, when you take delivery of that pack of paper, you have accepted it. So you've accepted that it's yours, and therefore legally it's yours. If you then walk out the shop, trip over and drop it into a huge puddle of water, and it gets covered in muddy water and you can't use it, it's your loss rather than the paper, paper supplier's loss. So let's just cut that down. What we're really looking at here, therefore, is this difference between the budget cycle, which is when we are encumbering funds, saying how much cash have we got to spend, and the accounting cycle. In the accounting cycle, under IPSAs and IFRS, accruals basis, it's legally when we have these goods that we would say, this is ours. And that's the point at which we recognize the expense. So slide number two, we talked a little bit in kind of theory about at what point under accrual accounting do we recognize an expense. In slide number three, what we've done here is that we've taken some phrases from some legal documents and from the standard themselves. So don't get, don't get too worried if these things are suddenly big, fancy, difficult to understand terms, because they're actually fairly, fairly straightforward. An obligating event is an event that tells you you have a liability. So an obligating event is an event that tells you that you have a liability. Okay. Right, there are two types of two types of obligations. And and both of these I think actually maybe I'm being a bit cheeky here, but both of these date back to Scottish to, to British law. The first one is what we would call an absolute obligation or here a legal obligation. This is where an obligation or and what we're really talking about is liabilities. So we have a liability and the liability arises because of something which is written into law. So you have a contract, you take delivery of a motor vehicle. When you take delivery of that motor vehicle, the contract kicks in and you must then pay sums of money. So therefore you have a liability because of a contract. Or you have a liability because of some other form of legislation. So here under the legislation, it's not usually relevant for governments under IPSAs, but under IFRS, you have a liability to pay tax. So there is a legal obligation and tax is an expense of a business. You have a legal obligation to provide certain sums of money to people who have worked for a certain number of years in an organization. That happens in certain countries as well. So we have this idea that you have a legal obligation because of a written law, be it a piece of legislation or be it a physical contract. A constructive obligation arises 
from what we in Britain call the concept of common law. So you have a constructive obligation to pay someone because that's what you always do and that's what we expect. Let's assume that I sign an, I sign an agreement to rent a building for one year and my rent is $5,000 a month. And in that contract, it says at the end of the year, we will negotiate the contract for another year or second, third, fourth, fifth year, whatever, subject to agreement between myself and the landlord. Now let's assume that we get to the end of that year and at the end of the year, I'm really busy, you know, making these training videos and stuff. The landlord's really busy spending my money and doing whatever he's doing on holiday or whatever. And we just don't get round to signing that agreement. But let's assume that for another six months, I continue to pay the rent and I continue to occupy the building. And he continues to come round and repair little scratches and nicks and things that happen. Right, that creates a constructive obligation because both of us have continued in our roles as if there were a contract. The contract itself is considered to exist. And so therefore, if I suddenly go, ah, you know, I'm not going to pay you the rent this month. Or he goes, you know, I'm going to turn the water off so you can't use the toilets. You can't do that even though the legal contract has expired because we have continued as if there were a contract in place we can say that there is a contract and that's what the slide means and it says here by an established pattern of past practice public policies and so on and so forth so if you are doing something regularly consistently and visibly you are creating contract with those stakeholders around you and by their acceptance of your behavior, they are contracting that they are accepting it as well. So that's this idea of a liability. At what point do we create a liability? Either through legal obligation or also through our behavior and the behavior of the people around us. Right, there is no specific IFRS, no specific Gibson's that relates to liabilities in the same way that there is no specific IFRS or Ipsus that relates to expenses. Th these things are born out of this idea of accrual accounting. And so therefore we don't consider them necessary to have specific standards for those items. Now, having said that, certain specific expenses are covered, provisions and so on. So look at, look at your list of standards, but as a, as a general overview of expenses, we, we don't have a standard within either of them. Um, right, what we do have a standard for, however, under both IFRS and under IPSAS is contingent liabilities. So on the grounds that we're really looking at this in the sense of IPSAS, um, it's IPSAS number 19. Though, in fact, the standards are the same across the two, the two standard setting bodies. IPSAS and IFRS here are the same. A contingent liability is a liability which might occur. So it's a liability. Now remember that which might occur. If you're going to recognize these things in your accounts, they actually have to be more likely to occur than not to occur. So standard number 19 says that um, we only recognize a contingent liability when it's more likely that it will occur than it won't. Okay, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is that it must be a future liability which will arise because of something which has happened now. So we have an event now, that current event will give rise to a future liability. Right, if you look at the slide which is in front of you, the, it says there, number four, the best example is a lawsuit. I hope I spelled that correctly. I think that's a lawsuit, isn't it? Um, I lived abroad too long. Um, Right, somebody comes into our building, they trip over in the lobby, crash to the ground, break their leg and can't work. And that happens today. The speed at which the legal system works in America doesn't seem to be any faster than in my home country in Scotland or in any other country I've worked in. So if that happens, it's probable therefore that it's certainly going to be 2014 before we get to court, possibly even 2015. So. In terms of our criteria, 
what is a contingent liability? You've got the three things there. It's a present obligation. Well, yes, the person crashed to the ground now, so the causal, the causal event is now. There is a likely outflow of resources. Well, your legal department will tell you that. But if she crashed to the ground, there's no signs and there's whatever, banana skins or something on the floor, then you're probably going to have a liability. And number three, can we quantify it? Yes, in some countries, the person suing you will have to sue you for a specific sum of money. Um, in other jurisdictions, they can sum in general, they can sue in general, and the court will decide on the sum of damages. But in most jurisdictions, your, your legal department will have past knowledge of what's happened. So we have a contingent liability with our lawsuit. It, we have a present obligation, the person fell over today, likely outflow of resources, presumably here we have, and we can quantify it to within some kind of framework, we can make an estimate of what it is. So that's what a contingent liability is. This idea of liabilities which will arise in the future because of events which have happened today. Right, there are certain things which are excluded. Anything which is a financial instrument is excluded. So options, for example, would be something which you would imagine would be a good example. We give someone an option to do something in the future. That causes a liability. Um, financial guarantees as well usually come under IAS, what used to be IS 39, um, IFRS 9 now. Um, so anything which comes under the old IAS 39, uh, under IFRS 9, will not be included under IPSAS 19. Um, but th those are the kind of things as well as where you would see contingent liabilities. They just happen to fall under another standard. So there may be contingent liabilities which fall under other standards, options, um, financial guarantees. Finally, there are certain transactions which are specifically excluded. Um, one of the best examples, and, and for those people who are doing ACCA and doing ICAW exams, for example, this is one that comes up all the time and it's overhauls. Um, if you have some form of aircraft engine or a ship's engine, you will have to have the engine overhauled. Right, an overhaul means that you literally take the engine apart, clean all the bits, and then put the thing back together again. Um, and it's compulsory. For aeroplanes, it's compulsory under the Civil Aviation Authority Acts. And for ships, it's usually compulsory under insurance, for insurance purposes, that you have to have these things. Now, logically, if you think you use an aeroplane engine as every three years, for example, you use an aeroplane engine for three years, and at the end it comes out of service for three to six months, it's taken apart, put back together again, you would think, well, maybe we can accrue that over time. There's been a specific, a specific um, statement issued on this, which says that that's not the case, and overhauls are not included, because while the aeroplane's actually flying in in the air, there is no present obligation. So while we know how much it will cost, and while we know that there will be an outflow of resources, the present obligation criteria is not met. But if you are looking at doing exams in accounting, because you're doing ACCA, whatever, please do remember that a con contingent liabilities does not include overhauls, and we don't accrue the cost either. You simply take the cost of the overhaul as an, an expense, 100% of the expense at the time it takes place. It is not accrued either. Okay. When we are calculating the value of a contingent liability, it's very unlikely that we will be able to be strictly accurate. Um, certainly if there's a law case, even if you can guess how much money your lady who fell over is going to be given, you don't know what your lawyer is going to charge you. And you don't know what, their, what her lawyer is going to charge you either. So measurement is by best estimate. Um, in real life, you would make a best estimate, you would show the methodology that you used, and then you would discuss it with your auditors. Um, for me as an individual, I do not like the use of weighted averages. Let's assume that we have a contingent liability and the cost to us could be either 100 or 200 or 3000 and our lawyers have given us the probability. If you take the weighted average, you get 440. Right, I hope everyone's okay where 440 comes from. Please tell me if it's not right. It should be 100 times 40% plus 200 
times 50%, which gives us 140, plus 10% of 3,000, which gives us 440. Now, some people will say, okay, therefore, the liability that we provide for, so we debit expenses and we... Um, and we credit this this liability on our balance sheet is 440. Um, as an individual, I do not like that because the cost of this can never ever be 440. The cost can never be 440. So why would we ever show that as a liability? Having said that, I do know that in real life, we've had auditors who have accepted that contingent liabilities should be weighted averages. And I certainly know that ACCA has had examiners who've wanted that number taken in their exams. So therefore, if that makes sense to you, take a weighted average, fine by me. But in real life, measurement of these things is by best estimate. Do remember that when calculating the liability, your contingent liability, you should be prudent as well. So notice the double entry for this. Um, it is questionable here whether cleanup costs are a contingent liability. But let's assume that cleanup costs in this example are a contingent liability. What we do therefore is we take the present value. So we take the present value of the expense now. Right, I hope everyone's okay with this concept of the present value, yeah? So if you just look at your slide there, it says the present value of cleaning up an oil well is estimated at $1 million and the discount rate is 10%. So our, our pre-tax borrowing rate, whatever, is 10%. That'd be very high for a government at the moment. So what we do, therefore, is that at the very start here, so when we recognize this thing, we debit the expense and we credit the cleanup provision in the balance sheet of $1 million. Right, notice that is the present value. So therefore, if you're given the cost of cleaning up in five years is, you'll have to discount back to get that. So I hope you can all do that. Notice as well that if you have something like an oil well, and if we're gonna take the cost of the oil well into our balance sheet, then in fact, you wouldn't debit the expense. You'd add this to the cost under Ipsos number 17, to the cost. So therefore, at the start of this project, we recognize this provision for cleanup to begin with. Then at the end of the year, we debit our expenses. Right, is everyone okay where the 100 comes from? What's happening, therefore, is, is that the cost at the start of the year was a million. The discount rate is 10%. So we are increasing every year the cleanup provision so that at the end of five years, it reaches the full cost. So 31st of December, we add 10%. So it was a million to begin with, now we're adding 10%. So the balance on the provision will be 1.1 million. At the end of the second year, please notice how it's gone up because now it's 10% of 1.1 million, being the million we started with plus the 100,000 that we've added. What we're doing now is we're going to come on and look at a couple of special little circumstances um, in the next two or three slides just to bring us up to the end of this uh, liabilities part one presentation. So the first of those is where we have onerous contracts. Onerous contracts are the situation where you have a cost and the cost exceeds the benefits. Again, looking at obvious situations, one of the most obvious situations is where you rent a building and you don't need the building anymore. So in the building you have a shop and the shop doesn't make any profits. So you close the shop. But because you've signed a lease on the building for let's say five years, it still has a couple of years to run. Where you have onerous contracts like that, where the cost is obviously greater than, than the benefits, what you have to do, therefore, is you have to bring all of the expenses up front. So in the situation with our shop, at the moment or the point in time when the shop closes, you recognize all of the expenses of that lease up to the end of the lease at once. So all at that period in time. Um, it's a little bit like recognition of losses immediately that you have under construction contracts. But also it's born of this idea of um, the matching concept. Because if you're closing your shop, you have an expense, which is the rent of the shop, but you don't have any revenues to match with it. So therefore you show all of those 
all of those expenses and that liability therefore because if you've got two three years of rent you'll debit rent the full sum and then for the part unpaid you'll show a credit in the balance sheet so we take the whole sum due to the end of the lease as an expense in our income statement and then the liability to the end is shown as a liability in our balance sheet and that full sum will be shown you do that because prudence concept tells us show all of this now we do it because matching concept says there's going to be no revenue to match with it so we show all now so onerous contracts everything is brought up front and you show the liability in total to the end of the contract now another set of liabilities that we have um, restructuring and reorganization costs are worthy of um, special special notice um, these used to be very 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 common back in the olden days there used to be things in the olden days called extraordinary items so we could put restructuring and reorganization costs as an extraordinary item which meant that when we calculated things called earnings per share that they weren't included and these became very common in companies they would if you had a very very good year and you exceeded expectations you could make a provision for restructuring and it would lower your profit bring it back down to stock market expectations in the following year if you didn't do quite so well you would say oh we didn't spend the money let's release the provision and bingo your um, your profit goes back up again and it becomes a way of it can in unscrupulous hands become a way of smoothing profits there was a famous company in Britain called Rank Hovis McDougall and back in the 70s they had um, extraordinary restructuring and reorganization costs seven years in a row so therefore when we look at these things now there are specific rules on what is and is not a restructuring cost and what can be used but th there's no doubt that these things are um, they are you know, legitimate business expenses and God knows we've all worked for companies or government ministries that have gone through restructuring and reorganization um, the, the general view is that a restructuring and reorganization is a normal part of business and should be shown as, sh should be shown as such sorry I have new teeth um, so here we go there's the slide goes common activities that could create restructuring provisions include termination disposal close of a branch changes in management structure and fundamental reorganizations so you can you can see all of these things as I said what you're really looking for is making sure that the management of your ministry or the management of your organization for IFRS are not saying oh my god we've had a great year this year look how well we've done so let's try and bring the profit down a bit and create this reserve so that we can smooth and control the profit next year by releasing that reserve so again it's something for you to discuss with the auditors or if you are an auditor with the management why it's necessary and the next slide just continues in, in the same so just in just in terms of um, convention therefore right you can include redundancy costs and you can include non cancelable lease, lease costs um, you know redundancy costs what we're looking at is okay so show us that this is actually final if you're making someone redundant that's a pretty good sign that it's final and also non cancelable lease costs these are the things that we talked about as onerous costs um, so we can include these in the provision as well that we're going to have these unpaid or the, these lease costs which are sitting in liabilities right you cannot include training Tra training is, is almost never included in anything in the balance sheet because the problem in real life is that you train people as soon as you train them they've left yeah um, relocation from one office to another relocation is considered to be a normal business expense that happens all the time so therefore it's not part of a restructuring and recruitment as well the fact that okay we're making 500 people redundant replacing them by 50 new people fine but that people leaving people coming is a normal process as well right with restructuring what's important that you remember therefore is that they are allowed the, the government ministry or the individual company in the case of IFRS is allowed to make a provision and so therefore we can have an expense in the current year and we can release that expense in, in, in the future as long as it fulfills the criteria something is happening in the current year we know what it is and we know how much it's going to cost us 
but you must look very very carefully at those things okay thanks very much for listening you know the score now please go to the website all of the videos are on the website you can contact on the website if you have specific questions at work as long as they're quite short send those to us we'll do our best please like us on facebook please uh, follow us on twitter we're all over the place thanks a lot and we will finish this because we haven't done much double entry so there is liabilities two still to come along with inventory three and four i think there's leases three and four we've got financial instruments pensions there's loads of these things just waiting to be done yet thanks a lot for listening subscribe as well i think we've got quite a lot of you subscribing there's 20 people subscribing now so that's good as well okay goodbye